going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series and we're starting off a, a new section uh, dealing with wisdom. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you and uh, turn to page 1097 and you will find Luke chapter 6 in our text that we're looking at today. Uh, hey, a couple of things that are coming up that I just want you to be aware of um, in case you want to plug in and connect. We have an opportunity to serve our community. Teacher appreciation is in a couple of weeks, and, uh, and we're going to be serving breakfast to all the teachers of Lake Havasu City uh, over the next few weeks. And if you want to be a part of that, then you can go to our website, calvarylhc.com, click on the Serve tab, and you can uh, say, hey, I want to help. I want to provide some food, or I want to go and, and thank teachers and help do the serving. Uh, and, and just want you to know that we do, we do most of this through our life groups, but some of you aren't in life groups, some of you aren't connected that way, and yet you still have a heart for serving our community, and I just wanted to give you that opportunity to do that. Uh, also, if you're just at, at that place where you want to learn more, you want to learn more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, kind of the basics. You know, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, I, I, I need to know more of this stuff that they're talking about, and I, I just don't want to ask the questions out loud. We have a class for you. It's called Alpha. It's going to be uh, starting back up on May the 4th. We just finished a class uh, right before Easter. And uh, if that's for you, if that's for where you're at, then uh, again, go online to our website, sign up for Alpha. It's a life-changing opportunity for you to grow and learn and to uh, get better at this following Jesus stuff. And uh, trust me, everybody in that class is at that same place. We need to learn the basics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Hey, speaking of uh, learning and stuff like that, do you remember the very first time that you took God's Word seriously? Uh, do you remember that time in your life when you were reading the Bible or listening to a sermon or involved in some kind of a, a class and suddenly it was like God was speaking to you and you heard Him and you went, I have to apply that to my life. And you actually went ahead and tried to do what, what God was telling you to do and your life changed? Do you have those kind of memories? Do you, do you remember that time in your life? See, I was 17 years old. Uh, I'd already committed to go into ministry, and I started reading the Bible. I mean, seriously, reading the Bible, like every day and devouring it. And, and God spoke to me out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, where it says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. And I felt like God was telling me, you need to do this. And so I, I tried to do it. I applied it to my life. I changed the way I talk so I could honor God. And God changed my life. So over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at practical wisdom from Jesus. We're going to be looking at some passages where every week uh, we're going to have opportunities to hear what Jesus says about life. And the challenge is going to be this. Uh, you're going to hear some things from God. And you're going to have to decide, are you going to apply that to your life? Are you going to try to live this truth from God? And it doesn't matter whether you've been trying to follow Christ for decades or whether you've never actually tried to apply Scripture before. We're all at the same place. Are we going to hear God? Are we going to do what he says? And we're going to let him change our life. Uh, we begin today by talking about love. We're talking about love. Love is a big deal to Jesus. We all know that. If you've been around church at all your whole life, uh, or even just recently, you know love's a big deal. Jesus tells us to love one another as he's loved us. He says, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So we know love's a big deal. Uh, we know that churches and Christians talk about love all the time. We sing songs about love. Uh, it, you know, it's in our vocabulary. And I just want you to know today that God is unimpressed with our speech, He's unimpressed with our words, with our talk. You see, God wants to change our lives. And that happens to us when we actually take his word and apply it to our lives. How we're going to live. Uh, so today, I want to challenge you to listen to Jesus' words about love, about a radical kind of love. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. 
To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil." Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Wow. That is not an easy passage to read. That's not an easy passage for us to go, hey, uh, I can do that. That, That's simple. You know, it's much easier when Jesus just kind of leaves love like, hey, you're supposed to love people. But obviously, this is not a passage about touchy-feely emotions or churchy platitudes. This is a challenge to live differently. This is a challenge to live by a Jesus ethic, to really follow Jesus by how we love. You see, at Calvary, character is one of our core values. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And it doesn't get any more Jesus than love. Jesus taught us to love. Jesus modeled love. Jesus demonstrated his love for us when he laid down his life to save us from our sins. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus really is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then Jesus is saying to you, love like I love. Love radically. Um, So what I want us to do today is to dive into this passage, and I want us to look at it in relationship to our lives. I want us to evaluate our lives and kind of figure out what God wants us to apply to our lives. Now, when I say apply to our lives, I don't mean that you are to try to help your neighbor figure out what God wants to apply to their life. That's usually a temptation, isn't it? Hey, are you listening? You need to hear that. No, this is for each one of us. To really assess, God, what are you telling me and what do I need to hear? And then am I going to take that truth and apply it to my life? So it begins with understanding that radical love requires trusting God. If we're going to love like Jesus, then we have to trust God. You can't love like Jesus if you're afraid. You can't Love like Jesus if you're afraid of the consequences or you're afraid of being hurt or you're afraid of being taken advantage of. God desires that we trust him completely. And by the way, trust means applying God's word to our lives even when we don't like the consequences. Maybe especially when we don't like the consequences. Saying, God, I hear what you're saying and this is really hard to do and I'm not sure I can do it, but I want to try anyway. So radical love requires trusting God. Do you trust God to protect you and your family? Do you trust God to protect you and your family? I mean, he's talking about loving your enemies, people who want to hurt you. And he's saying, hey, you got to love them. You can't love your enemies if you're afraid they're going to hurt you. So do you trust God to protect you? That's a hard question. And I just got to tell you, I'm not a pacifist. Okay, I own weapons. So what I mean is if you threaten to hurt my family, I may have to preach your funeral. (laughs) Okay? Just trying to spell it out. But, But here's the thing. Trusting God means that we trust him to protect us. So for you and where you're living, is it in God I trust or is it in Glock I trust? you got to answer that because radical love requires trusting God to protect and to provide. There's lots of references to giving stuff away in this passage and not expecting repayment. And, uh, and that's hard. 
But God is saying, do you trust me to provide for you? Or are you trusting in yourself for your financial security? So we got to trust God to protect us. we got to trust God to provide for us. And we got to trust God to redeem, to reconcile, to, to heal our lives, to use your life in a powerful way to impact this world. Now, when I say that, I, I know that a lot of times we're tempted to think of, here's how it should all work out. Here's how the plan should be. And here's what I'm going to do so this will happen. No, this is not, not talking about your way or your time. It's talking about trusting God with his way and his time and us being obedient to his commands so that he can work through us in a powerful way. Because the more we love like Jesus, the more we're going to see his healing and his redeeming power in our lives. So radical love requires trusting God usually in ways that make us uncomfortable. So what I want us to do now is just to kind of do a reality check. I want us to look at Jesus' expectations of his followers when it comes to radical love and see what we really need to apply to our lives. So let's just walk through this passage and break it down verse by verse. First of all, Jesus says, if you're going to love radically, you got to love. Isn't that amazing? Verse 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Love your enemies. Do good to people who want to hurt you. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? That, that's radical because usually when somebody wants to hurt us, when, when somebody hates us, what do we want to do? Okay, we either want to hurt them back or we want to avoid them. Right? We don't look for opportunities to help them. We don't look for opportunities to do good to them. I mean, does Jesus really expect us to love our enemies? Yeah, he does because that's what he did to us. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were rebels, Christ died for us. In other words, we were harming God and yet God still loved us and did good to us because he sent Jesus to die for us. So he's asking us to love like he loves. Wow. Now, if we're really honest, most of us struggle to love like our family and our friends the way that God wants us to love. <laughs> you know, because Paul said love is patient, love is kind, a bunch of other stuff, but we get stuck on those first two right there. <laughs> and, and, and yet God is saying, I want you to love even the people beyond that, the people that are mean to you, the people that annoy you, the people that are trying to hurt you. Wow. And by the way, when we're talking about loving our enemies, make it personal. Um, uh, the temptation, and wrongly so, is to try to apply this in a broader sense, like to identify groups. And I've heard people talk about we got to love ISIS and stuff like that. No, we love, it, it's, love is individual. It, it's not in a you know, big corporate sense uh, that we apply it that way. You have to love people. You can't love ideas or groups and stuff like that. And so when Jesus says, love your enemies, what he's really saying is, who is it that has hurt you the most? Who is it that's caused you pain? That means that you are to love them and try to do good to them. Here, let me just make it really home. For a lot of people, that means you have to love your ex. Well, just making it practical and real. Jesus says, if you're going to represent me, you need to love even your enemies, and you need to bless and pray for them. Look at verse 28. He continues, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Wow. Let your words build them up, not tear them down. It doesn't matter if it's in private, in public, in person, or in prayer. Ask God to bless them. Ask God to help them. Ask God to heal them. Ask God to reveal himself to them. Ask God to change their lives. You know what that means? That means no gossip. That means no slander. How do you speak about the people who, who hurt you? Um, again, do your words bless those that it's supposed to be easy to love? Do your words bless your family? Do your words bless your friends, your coworkers? Much less, do your words bless those who curse you? If we're going to love, that's what the expectation is. So we're to love our enemies, bless and pray for them, and we're to give grace. Verse 29, Jesus says, to one who strikes you, 
on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Um, now, this is a cultural uh, unique thing. It doesn't really translate well to our culture. So here's the deal. If you were going to uh, challenge somebody's honor in first century Israel, you would slap them on the cheek. In other words, Jesus is not talking about an assault on your body. He's talking about an insult to your honor. This is not somebody attacking you, trying to mug you and rob you. It's talking about somebody who calls you out. Um, here, let me put it in a, in a vernacular that a lot of us may have used at some point in our life. Those are fighting words, right? You use that? Somebody's insulted you, somebody's insulted your family, and you're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt you back because you insulted us. You challenged our honor. And Jesus is saying, don't defend your honor. Give grace. Forgive. Refuse to engage in that fight. And, and, and what he's saying is, uh, what I want you to do is, is don't defend yourself. Forgive and let other people defend you. This is why character is so important to Jesus. Because if your character is representing Christ to the world and somebody insults your honor, you don't have to defend yourself. Plenty of other people will do it for you. Plenty of other people will stand up and in your way. And ultimately, what God is saying is, you don't defend yourself, let me defend you. Do you trust me to defend your honor? So give grace, live with an attitude of mercy, deciding that you will not easily be offended even by people who intentionally try to offend you. We're not talking about accidental offenses. We're talking about people who are intentional about it. Jesus says, forgive them. Now, honestly, the only way that's possible is for you to live with that understanding of how much you've been forgiven by God. In other words, when you wake up in the morning, decide to remind yourself, hey, you know what? God, I offend you. I sin against you. I abuse your mercy every single day. I insult your honor, if you will, every single day, and yet your mercy flows to me. When Jesus died on the cross, his blood paid for all my sins, even the ones yet to come. And so, God, thank you for your mercy. And if you live in that realization that God's mercy is flowing to you in an undeserved way, when somebody comes and offends you, you'll be able to transfer that mercy from God to them. That's the only way you can do it. Are you living with that awareness of how merciful God has been to you so that you can give grace? That's what radical love looks like. It loves their enemies, blesses and prays for them, gives grace and Radical love practices a generous life. Verse 30, give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. See, some of you hear that and you go, Jesus needs to listen to Dave Ramsey. Because <laughs> this does not hold up, you know, to financial peace. Here's the thing. It's not what you're thinking. Okay, first of all, because I know, uh, I read that passage and already some of our brilliant teenagers are thinking, I'm going to go outside in the parking lot on the way after church, and when people come out, I'm going to ask them for $20. Because they could make a killing today, right? Give to whoever asks. You're just, I mean, Jesus is testing your faith right now. Um, I think that's brilliant, but that's not what he means. Okay, I'll give you the ability to say no right now. Uh, see, again, this is a cultural issue. Because in first century Israel, they did not have social security disability insurance. So if you were disabled, if you were unable to work, then um, the only honorable thing left for you to do was to beg. And those who were handicapped would be placed in, in public places, and it was their job to beg from people. And Jesus is saying, when you come across somebody who is in need, be generous, bless them. Don't be stingy. Don't keep it to yourself. They're, they're doing what they can do. You help them out. You live a generous life. And, and then the other part about taking your goods and not expecting them back, it has nothing to do with theft. All right? It's not saying somebody's stealing from you. you let them do it. What he's saying is this. Uh, and again, first century Israel, they were under the oppression of the Roman uh, army. And so the Romans were there, and the Romans, by law, could take your stuff. They could borrow it. I need your animal, I need your wagon, I need your cloak, give it to me. And they were supposed to return it to you. Get that? They were supposed to return it to you? 
That was the law. They could borrow it at will, but they also had to give it back. And Jesus is saying, again, don't, don't try to, to advance your rights and demand things. Be gracious. Don't agonize about getting it returned. Trust God. He will provide for you. He'll provide for you. That's the only way you can read this and practice this kind of radical love is saying, hey, I know God's going to take care of me. I can be generous. I can be gracious because God's generosity and God's grace is greater. And finally, if we're going to love like Jesus, we got to practice the golden rule. The golden rule. Did you catch verse 31? And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Do so to them. It, it, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, do to others as they did to you. <laughs> no. Jesus is saying, if you're going to love like I love, then you live a life where you do to others as you wish that they would do to you. So if you want a life that is uh, where you receive kindness and patience and generosity from others, what do you need to do? You need to be kind, you need to be patient, you need to be generous to others. If you want a life where you are forgiven, you receive mercy, and people you know, rebuke you with kindness and gentleness, then that means that you need to be somebody who shows mercy, who gives forgiveness, who rebukes gently. You see, we're going to reap what we sow. And by the way, when I say this, I, I, I've got to address this issue because it just popped into my head when I was reading the text and, and going through this. Um, Jesus is not talking about karma, okay? This is not karma. And I mention that because I see Christians posting stuff about karma. I hear people talking about, well, that's karma. No, karma is a Buddhist Hindu idea that your past life affects your future lives. Okay, by the way, just for the record, we don't believe that. We believe in this biblical concept given to us by God called reciprocity, which means you will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. I mean, Scripture says that over and over and over again. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. You see, it, that, that's reality. So if you pour love into other people, guess what you're going to get back? Yeah. If you pour kindness into others, guess what you're going to get back? Yeah. You guys see this? We have to be able to understand this because karma is crap. And if you're going to quote me on that, use a K, okay? Because it looks good on paper. Sorry, that was the most quoted part from last night on Facebook. So, um, practice the golden rule. If you're going to love people, do that. You see, this is just a summary of Jesus' practical wisdom for our lives. And we have to decide, are we going to live it or not? So as his follower, do you have the courage to love radically, to love like Jesus? Now, if you decide that you do or you want to try to, be aware that Jesus also told us about the results of radical love. He spelled them out in this passage as well. So I want to call your attention to these because I think these are really cool. If you decide you're going to love like Jesus, you're going to trust God and try to live this radical love, what happens? First of all, it sets you apart. It makes you holy. Did you catch this part? Verse 32 and 33. If you love those who love you, big deal. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, big deal. Even sinners do the same. In other words, Jesus says, if you want to stand apart, if you want to show the world Jesus, then we have to live differently than the world lives. By the way, the word different is what the root word holy comes from. Different like God is different. That's what holy is. And God is calling us to live differently like Jesus lived differently. And even unbelievers, people who don't believe in God, are nice, loving, kind to their friends. I mean, come on, anyone can join a club or a fraternal organization or an affinity group and be accepted. And uh, you just have to conform to what they want. And there are lots of dying churches across America right now that really believe that they are friendly churches. Why do they believe that? Because they like each other. 
They're friendly to each other because they all look the same and act the same and dress the same and believe the same stuff. And so they, they're all warm and fuzzy toward each other. But let somebody walk in the door who looks different or acts different or lives by different values or, God forbid, would vote differently. And they're not welcome. They're not wanted. That's what the world does. That's not what Jesus does. That's not what Jesus' people do. And, and that's why we're going to love people when they walk in here. It doesn't matter uh, what they look like, what they live like, who they are, what they believe, even how they vote. They're welcome at Calvary because Jesus welcomes them. And he loves them. And we have to love differently if we're going to represent Jesus to the world. It's not how you treat your friends that sets you apart. It is how we treat strangers and annoying people. Yeah, there's some people in your life because God wants to teach you how to love. It's how we treat the enemies. That's what sets us apart. And if we love like Jesus wants us to love, God will reward us. Look at verse 35. Jesus says, love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Did you catch that? Jesus said, if you love like he loves, your reward will be great. God is watching us. God is cheering us on to trust him. He's pulling for us to love like Jesus. And when we do this, then God blesses his children abundantly. I mean, if you're a parent and you've got kids, you know that you want to bless your kids. But when they rebel, when they disobey, when they defy your values and your life, you can't bless them. And it breaks your heart, doesn't it? But when your kids, when they, when they follow your example, when they follow your lead, when they embrace your values, when they make you proud, when they do the things that you want them to do, you pour out your blessings on them. You celebrate that. Hey, if we do that being evil, how much more will our Heavenly Father bless us if we embrace his values and his ethic and we live like Jesus and we love like Jesus? Our reward will be great. Now, it doesn't mean that you get what you want for reward, okay? Because some of you are like, I'm gonna obey Jesus so I can get rich. Doesn't work that way. I'm gonna obey Jesus so I can get healthy. Doesn't always work that way. Here's the thing I know, God's gonna bless you he doesn't tell you how he's going to bless you. He's just going to fill your life with his blessings, with his goodness, with his grace, with his love, with his joy, with his peace. Things that money can't buy. He's going to do that. It's way better than getting a gold star. And here's the thing. It is completely legitimate to obey because you want God to bless you. Now, it's not the highest motivation. The highest motivation is you do what God wants because you love God and you know he loves you. But I'll just be honest, it motivates me to know that, hey, if I do what God wants, then he's going to bless me. Because some days I want to do what God wants no matter what, and other days it's like, eh. But knowing that if we love like Jesus, God is going to give us a great reward. That, you know what? Some days that's enough to go, I I'm, I'm want to step into that place where God's blessing my life because I'm obedient to him. Finally, if we embrace this ethic of love, and we love radically like Jesus, you'll be identified as belonging to God. End of verse 35. Your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. You love like Jesus, and people will know that you belong to God. And isn't that the point? As followers of Jesus, who want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with him through the love of his people and the power of his truth, isn't that what we want to love differently, to live differently, to represent Jesus to the world, to tell them how he's changed us so that they can experience a changed life. Um, back in the 70s, there was this old Jesus hippie song called They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. Anybody know that song? Yeah, right now some of you are hearing this tune in your head. It's kind of an annoying tune in a minor key that gets old really fast, but here's the thing. The song is true. They'll know we're Christians by our love. They, they won't know we're Christians by our empty platitudes or words. They won't know we're Christians by our worship songs, no matter how well we sing them. They won't know we're Christians by our bumper stickers or our Facebook posts, but by our radical Jesus kind of love. 
because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. Today, what is it that Jesus wants to apply to your life? Let's pray.